This episode has been brought to you by Audible.com. I'm not going to do the pre-roll read. You already know what they're about. If you like audiobooks, this is the place for you. If you visit audibletrial.com slash lowres, you will get a free audiobook download of your choosing. How cool. How exciting. This is a real novelty. I bet you won't hear that offer on other podcasts. Certainly not. Alternatively, you can go over to lowres.live slash store and buy from my own new audiobook division, Bit Crush Books. How about that? Go ahead and download my 2014 novella, Practice Makes Perfect in audiobook form, as read by Nicholas Joroff, a.k.a. The Wizard of Cause. That's just one of a number of goodies that are currently in stock in the low-res store, including the fast-selling Let's Play Crew Neck, which has been limited to only 40. That's audibletrial.com slash low-res or lowres.live slash store. Now, on with the show. This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I'm your host, Lores, and this is an impromptu, shorter episode than normal because I am eager to beat a whole lot of other critics to the punch in reviewing the latest Lars von Trier film, The House That Jack Built. Some people claim that the atrocities we commit in our fiction are those inner desires which we cannot commit in our controlled civilization. So they are expressed instead through our art. I don't agree. I believe heaven and hell are one and the same. The soul belongs to heaven and the body to hell. Last night I saw an exclusive one night only screening of the director's cut, The House That Jack Built. I don't know if you guys have seen the news since then, but Lars von Trier, IFC, probably Zentroper are all in trouble with the MPAA now, as if that even matters in 2018. Because apparently this screening took place a little too close to the actual release date that is set to come in about three weeks. I think it's set to mid-December. I have to say, it's almost fitting that the controversy with this film continues, because when it premiered at Cannes back in May, there was nothing but controversy. People that were walking out of this film disgusted. They were puking in the aisles. People were crying, you know. Usually when you hear these things about a movie, it's nothing but a whole lot of hype. Like I remember The Human Centipede came out and then you actually went and watched the film and it's it's uh you know it's it's weird in its topic and its subject matter and what the guy intends to do with the victims. But there's nothing particularly gratuitous about it. Like, you're not seeing... I don't I don't recall, really, but I don't remember seeing people, like, vomiting shit from their stitched-up mouths and all that. You know, I, I didn't think it was that bad. So, I, I you know, I, I did not go into this movie with any of that in my head. I'm a fan of Lars von Trier. I like what he does. I think his career as of late has actually been on the incline. I find his more recent films to be the best of his career. And so I was more so curious about how this movie, The House That Jack Built, would stack up against two of, in my opinion, the best films of his career, or if you want to consider it one, Nymphomaniac Volumes 1 and 2, which were released a couple of years back. That's all I had going into this movie. Now, having seen it, I did have to ask myself whether or not the controversy surrounding the house that Jack built would exist if it weren't for the current cultural climate that we have found ourselves in. And in truth, I think the answer would be yes, because Lars von Trier is obviously a bit of a firebrand, and he he bathes himself in controversy and negative headlines. I've never yelled at you before, Al. But I'm about to now. What does that look like to you? What does that say there? Uh, 30-odd-6. 30 30-odd-6, 30 that's correct. Yeah. But it also says Full Metal Jacket. And when I look inside... Get me a goddamn box, Al. And this time, make sure it's got Full Metal Jacket bullets in it. Is it too much to fucking ask that the contents of the box match what's written on the label? After his poor experience at Cannes a couple of years back, making off-color uh, jokes 
about sympathizing with the Nazis and Hitler, which nowadays you would get blackballed so quickly for doing something like that. But he did it. He was just, uh, you know, under the uh, under the line where that cutoff point began. Population. But anyway, I, I know I really wanted to be a Jew. And I and then I found out that I was really a Nazi, you know, uh, because my family was German Hartmann. Uh, which also gave me some pleasure. <laughs> so I'm kind of a, yeah. Sir? I, 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 what can I say? Um, I, I understand Hitler. But uh, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I think he did some wrong things. Yes, absolutely. But 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 I I, I can see him sitting in a, in his bunker in the end. <laughs> but I, there will come a point at the, at the end of this. There will come. I will. I will. No, I'm just saying that 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 uh, I understand. I, I think I understand the man. Uh, he's not what we, you, you would call a good guy, but I. Um, yeah, I I understand much about him, and I sympathize with him a little bit. Yes, not but come on, I, I'm not for the Second World War, and I'm not against Jews. Susanna Beer is no, no, not even Susanna Beer. Um, that was also a joke. I am, of course, uh, very much for Jews. No, not too much because Israel is a pain in the ass. But uh, still. Um, how can I get out of this sentence? <laughs> by, uh, by another question. I am, uh, I am, uh... And so he got uh, persona non grata at the Cannes Film Festival. And, uh, you know, eventually he did manage to come back, and this film premiered out of contest there this year. Almost every one of Lars von Trier's films has brought a bit of baggage along with their release, or rather more aptly, they expose the viewer's own personal baggage to themselves. The house that Jack built is no exception. As I stated before, the screening I attended in New York City last night was one night only, and the film was its director's cut, which will not be released when the movie hits theaters in about three weeks. So I've also looked into what is the real difference here between the director's cut and what will go out to the theaters in a couple of weeks, and that is primarily having to do with the gore of the film, the violence of the film. And I, I could be misinformed here, but I had read that the R-rated cut is only 80 seconds less than the director's cut, which clocked in around 2 hours and 35 minutes. The screening was really cool. I attended the East Village Cinema, which I had never been to before. It was a lot like an old 1920s theater and Matt Dillon was present for the screening and introduced the film and that was uh, very surprising and fun as a viewer because we were not given a heads up about that. And during this introduction that he gave, as well as many of the interviews that I've seen promoting the film, he states that the movie is not a comedy but that it is okay to laugh during the feature. And when walking out at the end of that screening, it dawned on me that the house that Jack built may not indeed have been a comedy, sure, but it was by far the funniest film that I have seen this year. And I don't know if that's more of a commentary on the dire state of comedy at this moment, or if it was just genuinely funny compared to those films uh, that were intended to be hilarious that I had seen and obviously fell short. Lars von Trier is an acquired taste, and it's not uncommon for his brand of self-indulgence and dabbling in the extremes to turn people off. Journalists and the legacy media film reviewers in particular seem to go extra harsh on the Danish filmmaker for his unrelenting and unapologetic style of filmmaking. Matt Dillon plays the titular character Jack, an engineer and serial killer who seems to represent Lars von Trier's creative spirit. He's a violent sociopath with the mind of an artist, and these aspects of his personality create a public persona known as Mr. Sophistication, a headline-grabbing serial killer. This movie is broken up into chapters like many of Von Trier's films, and each offers an unrelenting look at Jack's grisly desires. It also makes a great effort of explaining why he does what he does, 
in a creative way that I haven't really seen in other movies. So there is that going for it as well. The film masterfully bounces back and forth between hilarity and hideous violence, and in the hands of another director, a lesser director perhaps, the film could have easily drifted too heavily to one side or the other and lost its focus. But here, we get a Jack whose impulses lead to some of the funniest moments of the movie, and also some of the most difficult to watch in recent cinema. There are aspects of the house that Jack built that eke back to the work of a master filmmaker like Pasolini, a lack of regard for the sensitivity of the viewer, a lack of interest in offering simple solutions, and a lack of interest in offering its victimized characters any mercy. Men, women, and children die at the hands of Jack, and while he is an equal opportunist, it's the women who are at the forefront of his criminal trajectory. In a very meta moment, this is pointed out by Bruno Gaines' character Virgil, which then leads to Von Trier essentially dissecting his own work through Jack, and it brings us a montage featuring many of Von Trier's films. It's a, uh, like I mentioned before, he's a very self-indulgent director, and this is probably the uh, shining example of that. It, it, it's almost, uh, it's almost funny. There were people laughing in the theater when they started showcasing moments from *Nymphomaniac* and *Dancer in the Dark*. You know, it, it's very. Uh, very Von Trier, if you will. And so when you see things like that and you hear a lot of the large chunks of dialogue that go on and on and on, it's almost as if this film is intended to be a canvas for Von Trier to discuss some of the controversies he has faced regarding misogyny, abuses, accusations of Nazi beliefs, and a, a whole lot more. It is so incredibly pretentious, but Again, because it is being delivered by Von Trier specifically, it is both fitting and entirely palatable. The fact that it seems to make fun of the pretentious nature at times also helps and offers a release of sorts between those incredibly long monologues. Now, as far as those moments of violence go, they are quite extreme. I have to say that the dialogue surrounding the violence of this film is probably entirely warranted. Uh, maybe the vomiting in the aisles, not so much. I think those are some overdramatic fat ladies who walked into the wrong movie. I think she was supposed to go see Snow Dogs or something and got surprised when Matt Dillon popped on screen cutting up, uh, you know, some bodies, maybe. I don't know. But uh, in regards to these moments, the most notable of the film is probably where Jack happens to restrain his girlfriend, Simple also known as Jacqueline or Miss Jacqueline, and happens to remove her breast with a hunting knife. And it is, it's as bad as it sounds. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I was sitting in a row with a bunch of uh, what I could only assume to be incels. And they were like, not the 4 chan type incels, but they look like, you know, we play with Game Boy games incels, you know. And uh, they were laughing at every single aspect of the movie. It was really, really starting to fucking annoy me. I'm dr just pull me out of the movie at times. I couldn't stand the fucking laughter. They were laughing at stuff that wasn't even intended to be funny. It, I wanted to choke one of them out. It was bad. But the one moment where they did not laugh and instead gasped was this scene right here where he does cut off his girlfriend's breast. And that's around chapter four or so. This is one of the more interesting of the five. And it is, you know, you, you, I, I went with my girlfriend to go see the movie, and she saw that this was coming. So she does not like seeing these kinds of things. She turns away. Okay. But Von Trier, the master filmmaker, oh, he, he knows that people are going to look away. So what does he do? He cuts back to that scene seemingly at random a couple of minutes later. It's so good. Uh, you know, you do want to watch it with a lively crowd, but again, not the people that were in my row. I fucking hated them, and I kind of hope they all died in a car wreck afterward, but I digress. This movie here is really a movie worth seeing if you are a gore hound, I will say that. There is another really disturbing scene, and, uh, you know, you, you don't think that movies can really get away with this kind of thing anymore, and, uh, there's a moment where Jack happens to just... And there, look, there's a chapter in the movie where suddenly he just has a family. And you know Jack is a loner throughout most of the movie. But in chapter three, I believe it was, he comes present with a family. And he's on a hunting trip. And there is a moment where he guns down both of his sons or his stepsons. It is 
unapologetic. And I think that has really been, again, another source of the controversy surrounding the violence of this film. Because when you have a movie like It, for example, where you know kids are going to die, but there's a difference because It is clouded in this in this uh, fog of nostalgia and childhood that a lot of people have from the 80s and from the 90s uh, because of the book and the miniseries, obviously. And it does have that kind of Goonies, fun, light vibe to it, even if the subject matter itself is extremely dark. There's a difference between a spider clown monster eating children for its own appetite and Matt Dillon uh, blowing his son's head off with a rifle and uh, messing around with the body afterward, which is what I wanted to get to next, is he kind of has an interest, a very slight interest in taxidermy and photography, and he takes the body of one of his sons and does this weird, almost uh, Tim Drake in Return of the Joker-esque uh, mock-up of his son where he's using like fish hooks to to peel the lips back and create a smile and it's so weird and it, I I loved it I I thought it was really bold and daring for uh, the current climate and just what's acceptable in film and I I really dug that part <clears throat> you know he just he creates this this frightening mannequin of the boy's former self it's really something to see so, the house that Jack built is thoroughly entertaining, and as I said before, Von Trier's best film in his 30 years of filmmaking. If Lars Von Trier were to quit tomorrow, or, or you know, he's a bigger guy, he's an older guy, he could have a heart attack and just wind up in the grave soon. You know, I don't want to be morbid, I hope that doesn't happen until he's 100 and he keeps making films up until that point. But, if that were to happen, this would be an exquisite film to go out on, especially just considering how self-referential it is. And, uh, you know, it is pure Lars von Trier. Truly, it would put a bow on this unique career of his. I have no clue how much the R-rated version will differ from the cut I saw last night, but, uh, you know, apparently this one is more violent. Uh, that goes without saying, probably. But if it's anything like the movie that I saw. I have trouble not recommending this film because I do consider it one of the best to come out this year and oddly enough probably one of the most fantastical and yet also likely accurate depictions of a serial killer or serial killings to be found on film. We've created this kind of image of a serial killer who is so meticulous and Jack does have that aspect of himself where he does suffer from OCD and there's a hilarious outright hilarious sequence in the movie where uh, that OCD just happens to be flaring up after he kills a woman. But we, we have this idea that they're so neat and prim and proper and they're very intellectual. And in reality, you know, if you dig into the biographies of a lot of serial killers, you know, they're, they're just kind of backwoods dummies who are of relatively average intelligence. Sometimes you'll come across like a Ted Bundy type or Jeffrey Dahmer, who maybe is of a higher intellect. But uh, the thing that this movie does that differs so well from another piece of serial killer media like American Psycho or Dexter is that Jack acts sloppy, and he gets gradually sloppier, and it does lead to his downfall in the end. But up until that point, there are so many moments where it could all come crumbling down, and yet... Seemingly because of luck, or maybe Von Trier's trying to get at the idea of a higher power looking out for him at some point. I think Jack actually makes a reference to that in the movie, that uh, there's some kind of amazement with this streak that he, he can go on of killing all these women and leaving a mess behind uh, at times, and yet things resolve themselves in a manner where he just carries on and is undetected. I found that to be probably more realistic, and that's what I mean when I say it's probably one of the more accurate serial killer films to reality, even though there are these big, explosive, uh, two-dimensional, almost, elements of the film. Like, the movie ends with Jack being escorted down to hell by Virgil, and it's something out of a Greco-Roman painting, you know? It, it, it's so beautiful and... Uh, over the top, and it's not something you would find in any other film. The house that Jack built 
does offer a good balance between that and grisly reality, which is something that I think really only David Lynch has accomplished in the past. Not to say that this film is Lynchian by any means, because I don't think that it is, even though uh, that ending was actually what kind of lost my girlfriend at the end of the screening. And she said, quote unquote, it got to Lynchy. But, but it, it's, it's genuinely nothing like anything that David Lynch would do. I'm just merely stating that Lynch has a good two-layer reality to his films, where you have this kind of suburban, mundane life, and then just beneath that is an underbelly of unspeakable darkness. And this film has that, but it flips it on its side and makes both of those two aspects visible to the viewer. So again, I highly recommend this movie. I know it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, especially if you're not a Lars von Trier fan. If you're somebody who thinks he's too up his own ass, then you're not going to like this movie, especially this movie, because it does get very self-referential and self-important at times. But uh, if you take it for what it is and recognize that Lars, is, as often as he's being earnest, is also, I think, being satirical and ironic then those aspects of the movie maybe won't grate on you. But anyhow, I'm going to wrap up this review right here. Again, you guys know where to find me on the internet. You got to know where to find me. Twitter.com slash LowResWB or Facebook.com slash LowResWB or head on over to Instagram. I got I to gotta work on this Instagram thing. I get a couple of new followers a day, then those followers disappear. I get folks from Russia, travel, vlog people that have no interest in anything that I'm posting aside from an immediate whatever I put up. And then they just go away. They disappear into the mist. Kind of curious. Mm. Very, very suspicious. It's almost like those, those, those followers aren't even real people. Like they've just been robotically programmed to do that kind of thing in hopes that you'll follow them back and then they'll obviously drift away from your profile without notice. But you can find me there. And last but not least, if you want to get some exclusive content, such as the next episode, which will be a dialogue on the movie First Reform with Jake, the cinematologist, that is available right now for $1 and up patrons on patreon.com slash lowres. I'm also going to be releasing an exclusive clip from this series that I've been in production on for quite a few months now. So that'll be something to look forward to. There is also a six and a half minute preview of my documentary that will be dropping this month, The Death of SNL and How to Bring It Back to Life. Anyhow, folks, thank you again for listening. We will be back on Tuesday with Jake Miller, the cinematologist. I will see you then.